go ahead. I'll be honest, I, I played a very high standard. Young uh, superstar, give some lessons. Determination. Was extremely, extremely Welcome to the Chess Underground. Eccentricities, peculiarities, and theoretical novelties. And I felt be down in plain proper box in my style. I felt a sense in my style and skills. I only do so. From a distance. Okay, welcome back to the Chess Underground. This is the February 2022 episode. I'm here with international master Kostya Kavutsky. Kostya, how's it going? I'm, I'm doing well, Pete. How are you? I am excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, you work with a, a really great YouTube channel called The Chess Dojo. For our listeners out there who aren't familiar with it, what exactly is The Chess Dojo? Yeah, so... Uh, Chess Dojo, as it stands today, is basically a uh, four-person team. Uh, there are three uh, senseis, basically. It's <laughs> me and International Master David Pruis uh, and Grandmaster Jesse Cry. And we're kind of like the chess teachers for the channel. Uh, we have a Twitch channel, and we uh, put videos on our YouTube page. Um, and I guess our most important function is we run... Uh, a Discord server, which is, I guess, the actual uh, dojo itself. And uh, this is just a great community and a place where uh, we have lots and lots of chess players that uh, are discussing different things, chess, uh, teaming up, uh, playing training games against each other. Um, basically, we've been able to build build this like really nice community of, of chess players um, a lot of like OTB tournament players, a lot of players that like just do online. And um, yeah, now our job is to just kind of run this community uh, and basically try to get everyone, everyone better at chess. I love this. I love this name and like this whole idea of like the dojo and having senses, right? Where did this originate? Is someone, was someone just like a huge Karate Kid fan slash Cobra Kai, I guess? Or how, how did the, how did the idea, like, what's the genesis of the idea here? Um, yeah, so the, originally, uh, I, uh, I think I came up with the name somehow. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure I was inspired by, by something. <laughs> um, I, I'm just struggling to remember exactly like what it, it could have been. Um, but, uh, I, at the time, this was basically December, uh, like 2019 or so. So it wasn't, mm. wasn't too long ago. Uh, I basically felt like Discord was just like a great tool uh, and could be used for like a chess community. Um, and I felt like there wasn't a place for people to like come and like if they want to find a training partner, like to, to seek one out, which I felt like was a really important part uh, of just like uh, chess training. Like so many players benefit from just having like a, a training partner. And it didn't seem like it was easy to find one for, for many players. Um but uh, yeah, the idea of like the the dojo itself, um, man, that's. Oof, I wish I had a I wish I had a better <laughs> answer, uh, but it was something just about having a place where like, you know, the the focus is on uh, improvement um, rather than uh, like any uh, specific like one one person. Because uh, a lot of Discord servers are just kind of like, you know, like a Twitch channel and it's like it's their Discord or like a YouTube channel and so on. Um, this was actually kind of vice versa. This one started as the Discord and then and eventually we like started uh, a Twitch channel from it. I really like that because, you know, it's so important to have a sparring partner. And I have this like this image evoked of like an, an actual physical dojo, you know, where you can find a sparring partner and mm -hmm. having that training person around your level is so critical you know my my guest the the previous month um was jj lang who also does some chess coaching and um 
you know, one of the things that we talked about was just how important it is to be able to train with your peers, right? To be able to play not just like a training game, but have like conversations with them and, and some of the struggles they're having and interact interact like that. And Discord really opens the door for that possibility in a way, I think, that Chess hasn't seen before. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. One of the things that I was I was noticing on your channel is you have sort of like different um I guess maybe shows is the right way to put it. Uh, a good example was the ultimate sensei. Can you tell me a little bit about that one and how that got going? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so ultimate sensei is one of our more fun shows. Cause I guess we do <laughs> kind of a mix of like really uh, instructional stuff mm -hmm. versus stuff that's definitely geared to be more kind of like entertaining. Um, ultimate sensei is kind of a mix of, uh, of both. It's our main reality style show. Um, this is one that me and uh, David, David Pruis, uh, both have been kind of like secretly wanting to do for, for a while. Uh, him, I think for like many, many years, he's, he's had this idea. Um, <laughs> Is someone like perhaps like, like a Top Chef fan? I get that's sort of the sensation I get <laughs> from, from looking at it. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I'll tell you for me, it was, very much inspired by the show called uh, Ultimate Fighter. Okay. Which was like a UFC show that essentially runs uh, in a very similar way. Um, and yeah, and he's, another way to understand it, it's kind of like maybe a, a slightly more serious version of, of Pog Champs, mm -hmm. where it's like we just take a bunch of players that are all around like the same rating range. This latest season, it was um, players that were between like 14 to 1600 uh, OTB rating or like a little bit higher online. And uh, we see like who can kind of improve the most over like a two month period. And, and they're working with different coaches. So on this latest season, uh, I was one of the coaches along with uh, three others. We have, um, I am Andres Toth, who's also a, a streamer uh, and doing a lot of uh, great YouTube videos. Uh, and then we had uh, Matt Kolosowski and then uh, Sasha Oblins uh, Seva. Um, who and, and they're all like uh, streamers and uh, great coaches, and we each got two students, uh, and we were working with them for the past two months. Basically, the season actually just finished this this last weekend. Um, maybe I won't spoil it uh, for fans uh, who wins, but um, all the episodes are up on YouTube, and, and people can can follow and, and watch the show. Um, I guess the cool thing is that there's all these different coaches involved, and they're all like doing lessons. Uh, and streaming them live for everyone throughout the season. So everyone's kind of getting to learn along with the student. Um, and then, of course, the students, they battle it out in like a final um, kind of bracket style tournament, which which was a lot of fun. So as one of the coaches, I'm very curious about your experience because, um, you know, chess, as I'm, as I'm sure you know, is sort of like this lifetime of learning almost, right? You know, mm -hmm. I feel like, I'm learning new things every day, every time I consume chess content, whether it's a book or, you know, a video or a stream or what have you. And for this show, the ultimate sensei, you've only got, if, if I, if I remember correctly, it's only eight weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've only got eight weeks to work with a student. How did you find that? What were, what were some of the challenges in terms of, I mean, you're, you're, you're really condensing the time frame there. Eight weeks probably seems like a long time <laughs> to a lot of people. Right. But as a chess coach, I kind of feel like eight weeks is just so short of amount of time with a student. So what were the challenges you encountered with the condensed window and how did you, how did you meet them? Yeah, no, honestly, it went by so fast because it basically started right around Thanksgiving time. And then there was like a bunch of holidays and I had like a couple tournaments myself. And then, so it was like week one, we started working, um, I started working with the two students and then like I blinked and it was like week seven already. Like <laughs> The finals are coming up. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's super tough. I mean, uh, basically at the beginning I decided that um, we're going to work a lot on uh, calculation because that's, uh, that is one thing that I think you can improve if you're just like super uh, consistent about it for even like four weeks, like an hour a day, I think you would be like a much, much better uh tactician by the end or at least feeling a lot sharper and it's like um, a universal skill right like it applies to all phases of the game you know it's going to be oh, yeah. important at every moment 
yeah, it's also just like, yeah, the just number one most important skill that's going to decide uh, pretty much most games, you know, under 2000 level and, and probably even much higher. Um, so, yeah, I feel like that's just super important and something that can be worked on. Um, and then beyond that, we just did a lot of game analysis. Um, so, like, throughout the season, it's mostly rapid games that they're playing. So, I would have them just play the, the typical time control, which was like 15 plus 5. Mm-hmm. Um, which is pretty quick, you know, it's not like, it's definitely not classical chess. So um, we, you know, really have to worry about things like time management, like not spending too much time or not like rushing when you have like a good position. Um, I guess kind of like, really, we worked on a lot of practical stuff when it comes to like uh, technique and how to play certain positions. Um, yeah, when to like use time, when to try to calculate and be really, really precise uh, but it was certainly not easy. I think all the students in the field, I mean, they made they made great progress, uh, partly because, you know, I think they there's obviously a big competition. So there's like a lot of pressure on them and they and they want to perform well in the finals. But they also like know who the opponents are. So there was also elements of like opening preparation involved, because um, even though, you know, these players are not really at a level where the openings are, are super important. The fact is, if you know exactly like that your opponent is going to play a Karakhan or like a Sicilian, well then yeah, why wouldn't you like spend more time studying like Sicilian middle games or Karo positions or, or whatever you know you expect to get? And so because they could all kind of prepare for each other, it also gave them this like incentive to start like studying a lot and like really really working hard and because uh, they know that yeah they're going to be like you know seeing seeing this opponent in the finals or in the semifinals and yeah they really want to put up a good showing. Um, so. Eight weeks, definitely not a lot of time, but maybe something about like the added pressure and the intensity definitely gets people to like, you know, seriously work on their chess for a solid chunk of time. So that was good. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the bit about preparing. I would imagine that there's like a lot of almost gamesmanship, right? Like sporting gamesmanship, because at the end of the day, it is a competition and you want to win, right? So I was curious how much the students like actually you know, did exactly that, right? Like looked at each other's repertoire and said, how do I beat this guy particularly? Yeah, I think for the most part, everyone um, was trying to uh, to prepare for, for one another. Um, and uh, yeah, there was definitely a balance of like some players, you know, they just have their opening repertoire and they're just going to play it against everyone. And other players, they can kind of pick and choose and, um, you know, play different lines. And, and they had kind of more options to target their opponents. Um, and sometimes it, it can work out. Like we uh, we had one kind of nice success in the finals where we prepared the line in like the Italian game that we felt like the opponent wouldn't really be uh, expecting or like kind of comfortable. And yeah, they didn't like handle it uh, all that well. And the, and the student ended up winning like a couple of nice games using, uh, using the same idea. So we can actually be super, super useful. Um, but uh, I think it was more just that it like pushed them to to like take chess seriously for uh, a solid amount of time and like really have to, um, you know, when you know you're going to get an opening position, you really try to like understand it because you know it's going to happen over the board and you'll have to start coming up with moves uh, at some point. Yeah, you know, that's interesting you mentioned that specific thing about um, the amount of time you take and how seriously you take it. Just the other day, I was having a conversation uh, with a student, no less, about, um, you know, what really spurs chess improvement. And I think there are a few things. You know, one of them is, is of course, how much time you're able to put into it, how frequently you do it, playing serious games. Um, But we also discussed, you know, just the ability to find time to actually focus. In other words, how you study is often just as important as how much you study. How do you feel about that? Yeah, for sure. I think um, there's like a, an essence of like doing the hard work, as we kind of like to call it in, in the dojo versus um, just like doing the the candy stuff. And yeah, I think it, there's there's a huge difference between just, let's say, like watching a, a video and not really engaging with it too much versus like studying a position deeply on your own and then kind of analyzing it later with, with others or, or, or reading about it in, in a book. Um, yeah, and you, you definitely see it like with some players, they're, um, just kind of like 
working all the time and they're really curious about the game and they're just like studying all kinds of different positions and you can kind of tell like they're just not really looking for uh for any shortcuts it's like sometimes there's players that are looking for like kind of easy ways it's like you know how high can i get with just playing like this opening or like <laughs> this kind of thing and uh you get the feeling that they're not really interested in, in in like the game itself or like learning more but the players that are like really curious about the game they seem to be the ones that are willing to kind of put in um that hard work and is to like use an analogy like you know eat their vegetables like do their end games and uh, work right. Right. on like difficult calculation uh problems um so i think that's kind of the that feels to me intuitively like the most uh useful thing um i think there is a way to kind of you know make the the harder aspects of chess study a little bit easier and like more accessible for for players um but uh yeah no i mean in general it's um uh, it's very hard to improve it's like you have to uh you have to like learn new ideas in order to be able to play better moves ultimately but learning is <laughs> right. not not a simple process yeah and and probably those new ideas sometimes i, I imagine you know are difficult to access they might be reluctant to examine exactly what they need to <laughs> i remember this great chess meme and i'm going to i'm going to butcher it but it was something to the effect of like you know uh wants to break 2000 you know and it's like the drake smiling right and then the mm-hmm. drake turning away and shutting the camera is will look at end games <laughs> right, right? <laughs> you know uh so that's kind of that those always make me giggle but uh, but I mean that that kind of sounds a lot like what you're what you're talking about, right? Like the importance of you know, quote unquote, eating your chest vegetables. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, I think there's lots of those things, and and nowadays it's definitely like easier to like study openings, for example. And and I totally get it. It's it's more enjoyable um, to do so. But uh, yeah, it's like you know, I think most players if they look at their games and they try to understand like why they're losing. It's like often because probably like some calculation mistake or, you know, they like uh, misplayed the, the middle game, like immediately after the opening, they didn't like, weren't really sure what to do. Um, it's, yeah, rarely related to like kind of the, the easier aspects of, of chess study. So for the Ultimate Sensei specifically, and maybe the Dojo more broadly, um, where do you draw your players from? Are they more... Uh, scholastic players are they adults how do you select them and and what are you targeting uh we actually have a a a big mix you know we have people watching from all over the world um and i i would say it's probably mostly on the on the older side but we have uh, definitely a number of kids that that watch uh, our shows as well um so it's actually uh pretty pretty diverse i would say I'm, I'm like a, a big, um, I, I think maybe sympathizer is the right word, <laughs> with the adult improver. Uh, I consider myself an adult improver. I actually reached my peak rating after the age of, of 30. Um, oh, nice. Well, so, yeah, th- thank you. Uh, the, the reason I bring that up, though, is, you know, I, I saw you recently did um, a video on, on chess and aging. Um, what advice would you have for, you know, uh, older players who are looking at, getting into the game or getting back into the game. You know, a lot of, a lot of adults played as kids and then come back to chess later in life, particularly sort of in this age now where we have a lot of new chess people, right? We have a lot of people who are coming to chess from Twitch, from YouTube, from your channel, probably. Um, and, and from, uh, you know, from this, I guess, pandemic slash Queens Gambit slash Pog Champs chess boom. Um, what advice would you have to those adult improvers looking to, you know, up their game? Uh, yeah. So, well, let me just preface it, you know, by saying I'm not like definitely not an expert on on the topic. It's just kind of like my um, my thoughts as like a coach and someone who's worked with uh, a lot of adult players. Um, I guess there's like two categories for me. If if you're like an adult who you know played chess when they were like much younger and you've been playing chess your whole life. Uh, to me, it feels like you can still make a lot of uh, progress, but uh, I imagine it just gets harder and harder as you like 
get older and just have less time and more responsibilities, um, like you simply just can't devote that much time to like chess and traveling and, and all this stuff. So I think that all kind of adds up, but you still, I think have like have room to, to keep growing. Um, the main thing I would suggest, uh, is working on like calculation. Um, and I think a point that, that Jesse made on the, the aging show, uh, was he, he suggested that adult players find openings that are, uh, you know, not really relying on knowing the latest theory, but more kind of based on playing the, the structure. So like maybe like a Caro Khan or, um, you know, some kind of like Nimzo Indian, Bogo Indian, this kind of thing, which I think kind of makes sense. Uh, Jesse was complaining about his like fading memory. And, and so he was recommending that people switch to openings that are kind of um, easier to, to understand and don't have to, to, to be memorized. Um, but I, I think that working on uh, calculation seems to be uh, the thing to do. Um, actually, one recent example I noticed was uh, my friend Doug Eckert, who, you know, is on the older side, but has had like a great uh, couple of like chess years. And uh, he mentioned that he's just been doing a ton of training with like uh, killer chess training, which is um, Agard's uh, uh, online uh, like uh, uh, group coaching uh, system, I guess. And uh, just working like a ton on, on his calculation. And, and that seems to have been doing really, really well for him. Um, now for the adult players that have not been playing chess their whole life, uh, and like have just like recently got into the game. Um, one thing I would strongly, strongly recommend is to stay away from blitz. Because I feel like a lot of players, they pick up the game. And honestly, not even just for adult players, but just for beginner and newer players in general. Like people get into the game and then they start playing a lot of blitz because that's kind of like the most popular time control. And that's what everyone plays. But then they find that they have like a really hard time, not just like hanging all their all their pieces. And they're really confused and they're like, oh, I'm so terrible at chess. You know, I keep blundering everything. But it's like, of course, like, well, you haven't, you haven't really played that much yet. So you need to, you need to realize that like the blitz is really, really hard, <laughs> even for very good players. You know, they blunder all the time in, in blitz. Right. So yeah. you can only imagine what it's like for, uh, for a new player. So, you know, blitz is, I think, great for maybe like testing your instincts and, and pointing out your weak spots. But if you haven't really been playing for that long, you haven't really had a chance to really develop your instinct. And so if you're playing Blitz, you're really just going to be making like random moves. And, and my advice would just be to like play much longer time controls uh, so you really have time to think about your moves. Even I would prefer something like daily chess where you have like one day per move. I think that would be much more useful than than uh, playing Blitz where is it like you just don't really have a lot of times like taking a test when you haven't really studied the topic at all it's like what like what's the point of this right <laughs> really right exactly doesn't make yeah. no sense yeah a timed test no less i mean there's so many mm -hmm. elements and constraints to like playing a single successful chess game right um mm -hmm. and then to add this additional <laughs> fairly extreme constraint in a blitz game right like three minutes five minutes are the popular time controls even with an increment that's a pretty extreme constraint um just seems almost counterproductive, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and th the thing that bugs me is that people then take it as a sign that they're like not improving and, or like, you know, they might be, have been like working really hard for like a month, but, and, and that won't necessarily translate in, into growing your blitz rating. But um, right. yeah, I think a lot of players take it as a sign. It's like, oh, you know, my, my chest training hasn't been working for me or, or whatever, but I think it really, um, shouldn't really be paid attention to. I think there's also a perception that, you know, you mentioned like, um, oh, my chess training isn't really working for me. There's also a perception that you have to almost measure, you know, in chess, we have this interesting measurement metric of a rating. And a lot of students, I think, sort of fall into the trap of measuring their progress via rating, which, you know, you can do to some extent. Um, but what advice would you give students who are very rating focused and, and oh, I just got to get my chess.com rating up to whatever it may be right yeah no super important question i i feel like we're often um discussing this on on twitch because people do bring it up a lot in general it does feel like people focus uh, way too much on rating 
And it's a very natural focus because it's like a number that, that goes up and down, right, when you when you win or lose. But I think there are like so many factors uh, that determine a player's performance that like you're, I don't really see how, you, you know, anyone will get anywhere just kind of tracking their uh, like daily uh, performance rating. Like what happens is someone plays some games, the rating goes up a bit, they're like, happy you know what they have been doing must be must be good then the next day they like lose some games and so <laughs> all of a sudden it's like oh the training hasn't been working so i think right. people need I to realize the wheels that, have fallen off oh no <laughs> this guy yeah. is falling yeah um and no we we get these messages all the time in, in the discord where someone's like man i climbed from like 1450 all the way to 1680 but then like this week i dropped from 1680 to 1620 like what's going on with me <laughs> and uh, it's I, called chess <laughs> there you go yeah no i mean it's just like it's just form right it's just like some days you perform better some days you perform worse right i think there's some kind of misconception that uh, because chess is more of a of a brain sport that you know the brain should work 100 percent correctly all of the time but you know if you just look at like any other sport like basketball like some days the players perform better and some days the players perform worse and this goes for pros and this definitely goes for amateurs. So everyone's going to have a range, you know, and on any given day, you might play anywhere from 1300 level to 1700, or, you know, you might be a 1700 in, in tactics, but once you get to the end game, you're more of a 1300. So everyone has like a range of strength that they're uh, capable of. And so the important thing is to just kind of keep growing and working on your chess and, and like improving your your fundamentals and some of the most important skills like calculation, understanding the middle games, knowing what to do in the end game. And over time, it's like, you know, your range kind of slowly Im improves. Um, and what you often see is like someone will be working for like two, three months even without really seeing a lot of like rating progress. And then all of a sudden it's like they shoot up to 1700 and it's not because of what they were doing like, you know, three days ago, it's because they've been just putting in the work, putting in the work and, all of a sudden, it kind of like finally uh, kicks in. I mean, in my experience, chess improvement has always been just like an extremely long-term process. Yeah, I um, completely and, agree. And there are only only a few times where I felt like, you know, I did something and then I felt improvement, you know, a clear improvement um, afterwards. And every time it was like maybe I like was working hard for a month, like doing a lot of like calculation work. And then two, three months later, I like, could definitely feel it like, oh, yeah, I'm much better at calculating now compared to three months ago. But it, it always takes a lot of time. And yeah, always takes uh, a lot of work. I, and, I, uh, yeah, I, could, yeah, I couldn't ahead. agree more. No, I was just going to say I couldn't agree more. And, and especially regarding like the time, like improving over a course of time and sticking with it and sticking to it. You know, I love, I love using sports analogies for chess, even though I think they so often are misapplied or sort of in the wrong spot. You know, you know what I mean? Like when you, right, hear, of course, when you hear the yeah. NFL game, like, Oh, it's a real chess game out there. It's like, okay, not so <laughs> sure. But one that I use with students is I'll say, you know, like, um, I, I used to coach soccer and, uh, in soccer, you can go and you can learn, I don't know, like a cool dribbling move, like a step over or something. Right. And you can mm -hmm. use that that day in practice. You can use that in the very next game. Whereas in chess, you know, you can be working on an opening very seriously for a long period of time, and you may not have the opportunity to use that in a tournament for months. You know, you may not have the opportunity to use that preparation, and sometimes you forget it by the time it comes around, you know? So it's a very different sort of uh, sort of process. Um, yeah, no, that's that's a good point. It's, it's just such a deep game, and there are so many um, aspects to it that, yeah, it's not like you can just put in practice what you learned the, the day before. It's really... Right. It really goes a lot deeper than that. Even an end game, right? Like you, you work heavily on rook and pawn end games. Who knows when the next time is you'll see one in a serious game. Um, and you have to just sort of maintain that level of readiness and understanding of that end game over a long period of time. So it's a very different, mm -hmm. almost like, um, I don't know. It's a very different style of, of training, I think. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and of course, there's like also just so many psychological elements right in, in addition to just yeah. like yeah. the typical domains like openings middle games end games calculation you have all kinds of different players and personalities and you know some are over optimistic some are over pessimistic 
Um, and yeah, so many different like biases one one could have. Um, which okay, it goes back to why like having like a training partner or someone you can like analyze games with sure, yeah. is super super important for someone to give you that feedback on on maybe things that you're uh, not noticing in in your games. So it's interesting sticking sticking with the sports analogies um, and this whole line of thought. And by the way, Costa, this is totally why I brought you on the show. I love I love nerding out about like chess coaching and <laughs> all okay. that sort of thing. I, no, I really do. Yeah, um, this is right up my alley. I've I like you. I've I've been coaching a very long time, um, mm-hmm. and it's it is like it's like an interesting experience uh, from both perspectives, the coach and the student. I'm sure. Um, but what, another thing that I always bring up, and I think this fits into our conversation about right this long term. Uh, tact to approaching chess training and, and how how that works is consistency and how important it is to be consistent not just with your training but also from move to move within a game there's almost like a level of vigilance you have to have in your chess that doesn't really apply to other sports you know you mentioned basketball right one one thing i always tell students is what's the worst thing that can happen to you on one play in a basketball game you know maybe you maybe you foul the guy shooting a three and they get four points maybe tack on a technical sure whatever you can come back from that right like you're yeah. you're that can, you, you can overcome that but like the worst thing that can happen to you in a chess game on one move is is hanging made in one and then you go on down the list hanging a queen hanging like there's so many bad things that can constantly happen you have to there's this level of consistency you have to achieve in your play um in order to like play a competent chess game. And this goes to your point about blitz too, right? Being able to play at that level of consistency with that added pressure is just so difficult, especially on new players. Um, do you, what do you think about yeah. that? What do you think about like consistency move to move, consistency in training and sort of like a, as an overview, as a broad idea? Uh, you know, no, it's super important. I mean, um, because well, like you said, chess is a rare game where one mistake can you know, not just ruin the game, but honestly can like ruin a whole tournament. Um, yeah. If, Cause then you dwell on it and yep. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I had a recent experience where basically like I lost to uh, like a lower rated player and it was like a, a one move blunder and it wasn't like hanging me, but it was enough to essentially like lose the game in, in one move. The unfortunate thing is the, you know, the stronger you get, the more painful these moments are. Because they're like rarer and they're <laughs> so usually true, in like so more true. important <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> situations. Um, but uh, I I do feel like somehow not enough focus is given on the topic. And my feeling is that because it's like it seems very simple. It's just like you know don't blunder, genius. Like the you know the 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 less you blunder, the the better you'll play overall. Like it's not hard to to analyze. Simple formula. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, there's, there's lots of different players out there and, and, you know, some players are, you know, they're very dismissive of their own blunders. Like they might play really well and they'll like blunder multiple times and they're just like, oh yeah, whatever I blundered, like doesn't matter. But it, it seems like they do it, you know, like more often than, than they should. And if they could just avoid those moves, they would pick up, um, so many points. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, given that. Right, just like losing your mind for for one second during a game can be like absolutely catastrophic. Um, it feels like we should be like putting a focus on 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 the topic of just like how to stay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. How to stay sane during a chess game? Because a lot of times you right. blunder something that it's like you would never miss in a million years. So it's just something like some weird disconnect that you're not uh, for some reason you you didn't see something that was right in front of you. Maybe we have um, a new a new chess dojo topic: how to stay sane during a chess game, <laughs> and how to stay sane during a chess tournament. Right? I mean, that feels like a good one too. Yeah, actually, that that is one I think people often ask for <laughs> some version of that. How do I keep it together? Um, yeah. You know, I I love just the whole idea of using um, content platforms like YouTube and Twitch for. Um, chess training and chess improvement. I, I'm curious, you know, to hear a little bit about your story. What drew you to producing content in this way? Um, you know, as a coach, there's just so many, there's so many avenues you could take. There's so many ways you could go about it. What pulled you into um, streaming content production, that sort of thing? Yeah, I guess essentially my, um, my goal was always to be able to make a living in some way uh, from chess. And uh, my reason for that, when I 
started, I basically committed to trying to make a living when I was around like 16 or 17. And uh, I had, um, I was interning at, at a bank <laughs> for a summer. And I really, really disliked the experience of just like going, going to the office uh, every day. Um, and around that time, I was also just like really starting to get into chess and actually like taking it seriously. Although I, I had played like my whole life as a kid, but I never really thought there was like a future in chess um, until uh, around that time. And so I started... It's interesting uh, because to me that feels like really young to know that that was a career path you wanted, but I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's because I had the the real world experience that I just really didn't right, like want. Like this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, I, t- I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I started uh, coaching and essentially my, my goal was to be able to to play chess and, and use that as a reason um, to travel, which I was definitely interested in doing and, and playing chess in, in different places. Um, and uh, it actually, the I guess the content creation started off with like, blogging and um, writing articles for uh, like Chess Life Online and, and, and the magazine. Um, and eventually I think that turned into doing uh, like YouTube videos and like just the very earliest uh, commentary gigs on like chess.com, um, which was, uh, I don't think the first one, I think ICC was doing it, you know, well before them. But when they started, I, I was, I think I definitely got my start with them. And uh, yeah, solely, I, you know, I've always, I've always mainly been a coach in terms of having a, a means of income. But, um, you know, last couple of years, of course, it's, it's become much more um, possible to, to also manage just doing uh, videos and, and articles uh, and commentary here and there. And, and now, of course, there's like Twitch and YouTube and people, um, you know, support us directly through uh, Patreon, which, which is great. Um, so now there's much more room to do more things than, than just coaching. In the past, it kind of felt like either you you were a top player or you spend most of your time coaching to, to make a living. But now it's nice that there's uh, a lot more variety because I do really enjoy one-on-one coaching, but, uh, you know, I also kind of want to be able to reach a lot more people when it comes with, uh, to chess training. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, you said just within the last couple of years, um, there definitely has been an explosion in interest in chess and interest in chess content, um, particularly on the web, right? Like you mentioned the, the various platforms. What do you attribute that to? Do you think it's all pandemic related? People are staying home, they're, they're indoors, everybody's you know, looking for something? Or do you think there's something bigger or deeper? Uh, what do you think it is? What do you think made that happen? Yeah, that's interesting. I kind of feel like, uh, you know, like a frog in a slowly boiling pot of water um because i've i've been feeling like oh it's exploding for like uh several years now um like uh, i guess uh i mean there well there have been many many uh chess streamers but you know last couple years chess.com has started doing like uh, a ton of events and of course there's all these like big time streamers now right and um like i okay i thought the boom was happening already before the the pandemic like things were really growing a lot like hikaru got like absolutely huge and yeah um uh you know chess bra was already huge for for many years and and so on but then then the pandemic happens and and then i was like oh i guess this is now the boom because everyone was like at home and then like levy obviously was was growing uh, quite a bit and, and others as well um eric rosen also like just huge huge growth um, and so it seemed like, okay, it's like the pandemic is, is causing this boom and everyone's like at home and, and now playing chess. But I think it was Queen's Gambit actually by the numbers that was the actual chess boom. <laughs> like everything leading up to that to me felt huge. Just like but, gradual, but yeah. And then it just exploded. And then, yeah, I think everything just like tripled with, uh, with the, the Queen's Gambit, um, which was which was really, I mean, just insane to to think about, but, um, yeah, like we, we have a ton of members in the dojo that, you know, they got into chess because, uh, they watched the show. A lot of them, you know, maybe played, you know, when they were younger, like uh, took classes in their school, but 
like the reason they got back into it or the reason they searched it online was just because of the the Netflix show. Um, it's so interesting you attribute yeah. it to that because uh, my wife, who I thought uh, would would never play chess with me, <laughs> <laughs> after finishing the last episode of The Queen's Gambit, set up a chess board and said, you know, can you teach me how to play? <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, this is this is so cool. So um, it, it, it was kind mm-hmm. of unique to see our you know, sort of in-home smaller experience played out on an extremely large scale, like inter- internationally, right? Um, with this, with this, with this show, like what one show can do for a game. Yeah. Now, I do think it was kind of a perfect storm with um, everyone being at home for the pandemic, and uh, yeah, and then the show came out when everyone is like, you know, watching the most Netflix they they've ever been doing. Um, so it was kind of like. Yeah, I think just everything just really, really worked out for um, for that moment. And then chess was kind of like uh, something to do. But a lot of people, I think, definitely stuck around. And I think, yeah, like all the sites saw like, you know, huge numbers and a ton of new players get, get involved. Um, so, yeah, I think that was the boom. When, uh, when, when you were working on the dojo um, and this was all happening, uh, did you guys, what, what did you do differently? Did you adapt? Did you change? Or was it just a case of, man, this is great. <laughs> let's, let's keep going with what we've got <laughs> and the numbers are are just skyrocketing. Um, yeah, so it's interesting because we, um, when we were like kind of teaming up um, because David wanted to, you know, he kind of wanted to have like his own Twitch channel, but then he thought it'd be nice to like team up with with some other creators as well. Um, the pandemic was only just starting and it wasn't really clear yet at the time that everyone was just going to be at home, uh, you know, for the next two years. So, um, like we were just kind of starting the, the Twitch channel, like in March, 2020, basically uh, we were still planning. And I think we were officially like, we were thinking about launching in like June. We thought maybe we like prep for a couple months and then we start, we, you know, we take off in June. Then when the pandemic hit, you know, we, I guess we got to move on a little bit faster because we realized like, well, people are just at home, at home right now. So we might as right. well, like we might as well just start strike streaming. while the, uh, the iron is hot. Is that the phrase? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And, um, and, and it w- wasn't really our intention, but we became like this kind of safe haven for like OTB chess players in the time of, um, you know, purely like online, uh, with tons of like rapid and, and blitz events, um, going on. So th- that was kind of cool. I don't think that was exactly our, our intention at, at the start, but um, it was nice to kind of um, keep the focus on like classical chess and and have a community that kind of shares in that um, in that value. Yeah, there was there was such a there was such a hole, right? Just something completely missing in in the chess world, and it was filled by sites like yours and content content producers who uh, really honestly I, I i really admire what you guys have done and stepped up to to continue the game and uh there was that hashtag grow the game right <laughs> even <laughs> even when all signs pointed to maybe it should be shrinking because nothing's happening right there's no there's no tournaments um so it was really cool uh i think you know you, you brought up um sort of the genesis and how you felt like it was bubbling for a while I completely agree. I mean, you know, if you think about the the tournament coverage that we had in like, you know, let's say 2017, 2018, compared to what was available even just like five to 10 years prior, it was a whole different ballgame. Uh, I don't know how much you follow the top tournaments, but just a, a whole different ballgame in terms of what was out there that you could consume. Yeah, the, the production value has increased just an insane amount. And also just the access that we have to top players, I think is really really incredible like even right. five years ago you didn't have like Svidler, Geary, and Gristra commenting on like the the candidates tournament or, or like the world championship or like, like these huge events I mean that's or, just absolutely or Magnus Carlsen insane. playing bullet chess from a hot tub did you catch that video uh yeah I'm sure I'm sure I watched it <laughs> yeah I mean right the world champion right like uh, that was just extremely unheard accessible of. yeah <laughs> How cool is that? I mean, we live in an age where just like, as you pointed out, right, all of the top, I don't know, 5, 10, 20 players in the world, you can hear their thoughts. 
um, which feels like just almost like a game changer in, in terms of in terms of chess and chess improvement. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, right. Uh, that's a big thing. That's just like, and I think because there's so much of it that maybe people almost take it for granted a little bit because there's there's like now so many hours of like super GM analysis on YouTube. It's like impossible to watch it all. Actually, it's just <laughs> way too much. But it's very very uh, useful if one were to take the time and really. Um, really listen to it. I completely agree. And and point well taken, like it's almost like we've swung to the complete opposite end of the spectrum, right? Like um, we went from being able to find like high quality chess content is pretty scarce and, you know, not, not, not widely available to you're just inundated with it. And we do take it for granted, but I love it. <laughs> I just think it's great. <laughs> right. We have, we have all this access right at our, at our fingertips here. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, no, as a chess fan, I, I enjoy it. And yeah, whenever I have time, I'm always watching like, you know, Leiko or Svidler or, or someone um, analyze. Um, yeah, oh, Chess Base India, by the way, another just like amazing channel that, that just does like so much like high level content, just hours and hours and hours. And it's like 100% free. I mean, it's it's insane. I'm, I'm actually so glad you brought them up because Chess Base India is one of my favorite chess Instagram follows. Do you follow their Instagram too? I I think so, but I don't really. Uh, I I hardly pay attention. I feel like they're almost kind Instagram. of like a a um, uh, a well kept secret in like the in like our hemisphere of the world. But they're they're so useful to follow and, and interesting, and they have uh, great coverage of of the tournaments as well. Um, so that's interesting. You brought that up. I that's the first. You're the first uh, content creator who's mentioned them. I'm a big fan. Um, well, Kostya, you, you have a lot going on. I'm curious, what about, you know, what about your future plans? Like what's next for you? Uh, I saw you went back to OTB chess recently and played extremely well. Congratulations. Um, yeah, do you have more plans for OTB events and also the channel? What's like, what's, what's on the horizon for the dojo? Yeah. So, um, I will definitely be trying to play, uh, several events this year. Probably mostly I'll be looking at like nine round um, events so that there could be some some norm possibilities. Are you um, actively pursuing the GM norm? Sounds that sounds like a yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like I get this question a lot. My answer is I'm just like trying to win like every single game like that I play. But um, yeah, specifically, it would be great to get the the title. That would be uh, that would be an amazing achievement, I think, uh, for me because I, I still think I'm I'm quite far off. Um, but uh, yeah, if I work really hard and I only end up getting like one norm or two norms or zero norms, but my rating goes up a little, uh, I'll I'll still be happy because I'm just trying to like improve my chess and like play some good games. Um, so that's awesome to uh, hear, and I just want I just want to highlight that for every chess improver, chess student out there, like here you go, just improve your chess and play some good games. <laughs> that's your that's your goal, right? You, you may have a goal, but, but this is what you really want to do. Because if you do that, you know, everything else will sort of organically follow along with it, right? Yeah, I, I, I do think I've, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit lucky in the sense that, you know, I've often just like enjoyed studying. Like I often have a book that I'm really like looking forward uh, to read. And uh, I definitely enjoy going through many, many chess books. So uh, what's, yeah, I think what's people, on your shelf right now? What are you what are you working your way through at the moment? Give give us a book recommendation. We can go check it out. Oh sure. Well, right now um, I'm actually finishing uh, Shanklin's first book, Small Steps to Giant Improvement, which um, I think was not really written for for my level, but like I had never read it before, and uh, I don't know. I think Shanklin has like excellent content in general, mm. so I really wanted to read it. Um, I'm also reading uh, Devorin's new book, uh, How to Study Chess on Your Own. Okay. Um, which is uh, is super, super interesting. I imagine you would like it as well. Okay. It's just all about training uh, and stuff. Um, and then I have like a number of books that I'm supposed to review. Um, oh, one book I'm, I've been very interested in reading, I've, I've read a little bit so far and it's it's been really interesting, is the new book by... Um, by Jan Marcos and uh, David Navarra uh, for for quality chess, um, which uh, 
yeah, it's a really interesting read. If if people enjoyed um, Marcus's previous book, uh, Under the Surface, I then, just uh, got that book. I just got Under the Surface, and I'm really excited to dig into it. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's just a great book. I, I read that one. Um, I guess a couple years ago now, but yeah, that one is excellent. And then yeah, I would recommend the the next one. I don't think it's like a sequel, but it's very very similar um, in style. And it's written with with David Navarro, who's also just like an incredible um, author and and player, and and singer. Apparently, did you catch his uh, his stream where he uh, he sang to the uh, to the audience? No, actually, that one I missed. <laughs> that was pretty entertaining. <laughs> Uh, well, that so so it sounds like GM Norm maybe as a pursuit for you, but just playing good chess. What about uh, what about the dojo? What's up? What's going on with the dojo? You just concluded the ultimate sensei. What's the next project or thing you have on the uh, on the horizon there? Yeah, so so dojo is definitely um, maybe my my main focus these days. I would say I have to kind of split it fifty fifty between thinking about my own um, chess progress and and building uh, or. or or building up the the dojo, um, but we're uh, we recently launched uh, a site where we're planning on putting up um, a lot of our uh, courses and um, maybe some classes as well. Um, something we realized, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about like all this great content mm-hmm. um, being taken for for granted. Uh, I have this feeling that like you know we could put out like a ton of super instructive videos. Um, on YouTube, and a lot of people would appreciate them, but maybe not as many as as could or that could benefit from from the videos. But if you put up the same content as like a course, and uh, and then you attach like a small price tag on it, but you basically you sell it as like a complete package, I think people actually just end up taking the material a lot more seriously than if they were to just watch it on YouTube. <laughs> so, right, and so it's I, almost like it's more it's more curated, right? It's more structured. There's a little more direction, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and there's a lot of players out there who are just like, you know, I'm willing to do anything. Just tell me what to do, step by step, I'll do it. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of provide that for them. the The real dream that we have actually is to create this kind of like dojo um, study guide, uh, almost like a training plan where where the the thing would be, it's like we would put up a list of like tasks or challenges for the student based on like your rating uh, rating band that you could be rated 500 or 1200. And we'd have like a list of steps that we think you would need to um, accomplish. So Jesse, he's really, he's really big into like annotating your own games and solving puzzles from Polgar's um, big chess book <laughs> that he, he really likes. So for him, these are like, you know, things that you have to do as a player trying to improve uh, your game. I have some other thoughts about it. Uh, I, I'm sure David has his thoughts about it as well. But basically, we're trying to just create this like kind of comprehensive um, checklist for, for people to go through um, and, uh, and actually improve their game and also provide you know, some kind of like cohort system where people can play training games against each other, play out certain positions against each other. Just the stuff that we think is... You That's know, one of my favorite exercises where you important. just you take a position in play, right? I love that. Yeah. Just throwing someone into a position and, okay, let's see your analysis. Let's see how you can handle this. Yeah, thematic middle game or, or an end game. Um, actually, one of, one of our mo- most popular shows is the show we do called Endgame Sensei, where uh, Jesse gives me and David an endgame position every week, and then we have to play it out. Um, sometimes we play it out both sides, sometimes just one of the sides, but... Um, it's always it's always very tough, and uh, and then we practice you know playing on the thirty second increment, which is so important these days uh, with OTB chess. Yeah, especially um, in the end game, right? I mean, it feels like almost all the time you're getting into. Well, by the time you get to the end game, you're you're close to or already playing on the on the increment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My recent tournaments, I've had multiple games that could have been like a training position. Uh, where I have like five minutes left, 30 second increment, and now I have to kind of like try to convert this position or try to hold it or or whatever. But um, yeah, no, I think that's some some excellent training. So yeah, we're basically just trying to figure out like what does it actually take to improve, to go from like 1,000 to 1,200, 12 to 1,400, and trying to kind of present that in a, in a constructive way. Nice. That that sounds awesome. So, uh, Kostio, if... if- 
people are listening to the show and they're thinking what I'm thinking, which is this sounds really cool. Uh, where can they catch up with you? Um, where, what are the what are the places to go? We'll we'll get the links in the bio for sure. But what what am I looking for? Just the Chess Dojo. Um, yeah. So basically, we're um, if you drop the the, we're just we're Chess Dojo on on most places. Um, and uh, it's actually funny about the name. I remember having to Google Chess Dojo to see if it existed, and it was taken, but all the channels were were very inactive. So I felt fine about <laughs> using the name. Um, but on Twitter, we're twitter.com slash chess underscore dojo. Okay. Uh, on Twitch, we're uh, twitch.tv slash chess dojo live. Um, both the uh, the Twitch and the Twitter, they have links to the Discord, which is where we put up all of our announcements and updates and, and things that we're doing and uh, streams and, and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and then the latest site is, uh, can be found on uh, chessdojo.shop. Okay. Awesome. Um, Kostya, this has been, uh, just a ton of fun. I really appreciate you, uh, sitting down and, and having a chat with me. Um, thank you for, for coming along. Is there any parting advice or words of wisdom you would like to share with our would-be improvers out there? Yeah, sure thing. Well, well, thanks for having me on. Um, I'd say, uh, you know, just just have fun, study what you love, find a topic that really interests you in, in chess and, you know, find a book you enjoy reading and read it and then find the next one you enjoy. And yeah, don't worry too much about it, but just focus on the long term improvement. I, I actually love that advice. I, 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 I say almost the exact <laughs> same thing to <laughs> students, which is find something you like, you know. Um, don't, you know, don't bog yourself down. Chess content is, is good content. If it's, if it's something you're enjoying and it's helping you, then it's the right thing for you. Right. That that's the bottom line. Absolutely. Great. Well, Kostya, thank you so much again to all of our listeners out there. We will make sure to have, um, clickable links for you along with the show notes. So just check those. You can hook up with uh, international master Kostya Kabutsi. Again, Kostya, thank you for joining me. Um, and thank you for talking about Chess Dojo. Yeah, absolutely. This was a ton of fun. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening to the Chess Underground, a U.S. chess podcast. Please check out our entire suite of podcasts, which release every Tuesday, and include Ladies' Night with Jen Shahad, as well as Chess Life cover stories and One Move at a Time with Dan Lucas. U.S. Chess would like to thank Jason Andre at Seven Season Films Photography and Media for a podcast production and editing. If you are starting your own podcast, visit www.7seasonfilms.com for consulting, production, and editing. Until next time, signing off, Pete Karyanis. <laughs> <laughs>